Three years ago, Canada United Church had the great privilege to welcome Amy Jill Levine during a full weekend. And for those who are not among us or those who don't know who she is, let's just say that Amy Jill Levine is a conservative Jew teaching New Testament in a university in Tennessee in the middle of the American Bible Belt. That enough should be, that, that should be enough to catch our attention. Amy Jill wrote a wonderful book entitled Jesus, the Misunderstood Jew, in which she tells an interesting story that I would like to share with you. And it begins, after a long and happy life, she finds herself at the pearly gates. And as a good university professor, she began asking all sorts of questions and inquiries about everything before she's told that it was a very busy day. There were many souls to process. So if she just could go to the next table and pick up her harp, her wings, and her halo and get in, someone will come and answer all her questions. Well, it happens that there was a, a good Christian witnessing all of this. And he asked to see Jesus because he had a complaint to lodge. Jesus shows up and the man begins to ask, what has Amy Jill Levine done in her life to earn the right to get in, in heaven? After all, she's not a Christian, she's not even baptized. And he said, and you, Jesus, you're supposed to be the only way to the Father. It said, it, it said in the Bible, I read it. So what's going on here? Well, Jesus replied, yes, you're right. She did nothing to earn her place here. She's not a Christian, she's not baptized, and I am the way to the Father. I am the way. Not you, not your church, not your reading of the Bible or any claim made by some Christian leaders. I am the way. And it's by my grace that anyone gets in, including you, my friend. And Amy Jill finished the story with this beautiful sentence, the last thing I recall seeing before picking up my heavenly accessories is Jesus handling the poor man a Kleenex to help get the log out of his eyes. Love the story. Today's reading from the Gospel according to Luke revolves around a centurion in the town of Capernaum. And the stories of, and stories of Centurion shows up re frequently in the Gospel in the Acts of the Apostle because the Roman army of occupation in Judah and Galilee uh, was part of daily life back then. And some of the officer, uh, uh, officer were cruel and greedy, while others were fairly good and generous men. So one day, a group of Jewish elders come to Jesus and ask to cure the gravely ill slave of a centurion. Of course, this man was not a Jew. He was a stranger, an alien, an outsider, but he was one of the good Romans. And the elders were considering, they were wondering if Jesus could bend the rules and make an exception for him. So Jesus followed them, and just before they, they get to the centurion's house, a group comes and says in the centurion's name, please don't come in. I'm not worthy to have you under my roof. Just speak the word, and I'm convinced my servant would be, will be healed. And then Jesus states, I tell you, not even in Israel have found such faith. Scholars 
tells us that biblical stories are meant to surprise and destabilize us. Well, the surprise in this passage come from the centurion. Because it's not a character we would expect to find faith. Uh, no res disrespect for those who are currently serving or have served in the past. It's just that military personnel, back then as, as today, are expected to work with orders. There's a hierarchy, there's a chain of command. And when your superior tells you to go there, you go there. It's not a suggestion or an option or something to be debated. No, 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 no. The whole system is based on the assurance that the people will follow orders. Well, faith is, is completely different. Faith is to believe something without having proof, assurance, certitude that it will happen. For example, on, on, on Sunday mornings, I believe my wife work in a cafe. Am I totally sure and certain of this? No. When I'm leaving in the morning, she's still there. And I also don't have access to surveillance cam uh, camera or GPS to track her whereabouts. So even if I have no proof, assurance, or certitude, I just believe. I have faith that she's over there. See? Faith, belief. These words are so often used by church people that sometimes we have the expression, they solely belong to us. How many times have we heard or even use the expression ourselves, the expression the faithful, the believers to, to talk about good Christians? How many times have we claimed that those who are not ready to commit to full membership in a congregation, not showing up regularly on Sunday morning, or not making a large donation to the church, lack faith in God? I wonder why we're still saying this, because faith has have, have so little to do with, with numbers, like the numbers of time people walk inside a church. Faith is not some sort of fidelity program that after 10 visits, we receive a free coffee. It does not work like that. Faith is not also, it also is not about orthodoxy or correct belief. Surely you have met some Christian who claimed they have the truth, who say they are right, and they have a strong faith, and on, if only we would read the same Bible they, they read, if we could worship exactly like they're worshiping, if we could adopt the same lifestyle, we would also have a stronger faith. We would know for sure that God exists. Last time I checked, I found nowhere in the gospel uh, a story or reference from Jesus asking us to sign a pledge at the bottom of a sheet to follow him. And, and there's a huge difference between being faithful and being sheep, following blindly anyone who has a staff. If you ask me for me, Faith is essentially an exercise of humility and open-mindedness. Having faith means that we're able to say, I don't know. Did God actually create the whole universe? I don't know. I wasn't there. Was Jesus really born in Bethlehem, uh, as we tell in our Christmas pageants? I don't know. I wasn't there. 
What happened in the tomb between Good Friday and Easter morning? I do not know. I don't have all the answers. Like the centurion, I'm not sure exactly how God's power and Jesus' miracles work. I cannot explain it. And yet, and yet, all my life, my past experiences, the people I encounter, my relationship, and all the, and the, all the relationship I made through the years, and also my gut feeling, led me to believe that God exists. That Jesus was not some sort of wacko wandering around. And the Holy Spirit can inspire us. And I'm ready to be open to a reality that I cannot touch, I cannot define. I'm willing to journey into the unknown, to make a leap of faith, to follow a direction that might not make logical sense, but still feel right. And maybe this is why we good regular churchgoers need character like the centurion in today's reading. Two weeks ago, John Young came to this congregation, Canada United Church, and reminded us that sometimes we take our faith for granted. We don't have to think or talk about it. We're the good one. We're safe. We're going to heaven. Case close. However, the, the Bible brings us this bunch of outsiders, unlikely characters, or as Pastor Varley Copeland wrote, gate crashers, the one we least expect to meet at the party God will be throwing for us. All those people find a way to challenge our assumptions. These men, these women, do not necessarily belong to the people of God, the nation chosen to be a beacon of light for the world. They're not supposed to have faith according to uh, our standard definition. And yet they teach us that faithfulness does not depend on membership of a club, does not depend on social status or some sort of approved lifestyle. Faith is a gift of God for everyone. And all of this brings us back to what we have done this Sunday morning. We had a baptism, a beautiful little girl. And some might wonder what this girl has done to be, the, to be baptized. Did she earn the right to be welcome in the great family of God? The short answer is, no, and that's the whole point of it. Promises have been made around the baptismal font. They were not a legal binding contract, just promises. And in five years, I will not track down the parent, knock on their door and inquire if they have done their part. No, I will as Canada United Church, as the Church of God, live in faith. Since we have made the choice to believe that God loves us unconditionally, and there's nothing that can separate us from that love, we've made the cho we'll all make the choice today that no matter the circumstances of the life of this little girl, she will find her own way. We have no proof of that, certainty or guarantee. We just have faith, faith that God will be at work somehow, and sometimes through the most unlikely characters. And for that, thanks be to God. And amen.